Now that we've looked at one tributer diene, we're going to take a look at the allyl system. That involves the allyl cation, the allyl radical, and the allyl anion. So and we'll see that with an odd number of atoms involved in the system, an odd number of p orbitals, we'll have a couple of funky little things here. So but remind yourself that the allyl system involves that allyl cation, or the allyl radical, or the allyl anion. So and in this case, in every single one of these, you've got three p orbitals involved in a conjugated system. You'll get delocalization off over across the entire system. We can see this like in the context of drawing resonant structures for each of these. Uh, but with three p orbitals involved, that's why we've got one, two, three molecular orbitals, and we'll comprise them all of three orbitals, as we'll see here in a minute. Now, a couple things. So here I've got it for you, and we'll show how to create this uh, same drawing in just a second. But a couple things you should remember is that uh, your first molecular orbital, the lowest energy one, is symmetric, and then your second one's anti-symmetric, and your third goes back to being symmetric. We can also count the number of vertical nodes, if you recall as well, and your lowest energy one has zero nodes. Your second one there has one vertical node right down the middle. And then your second one here has two vertical nodes in the drawing there. So always works that way. Again, uh, these will be important later for some of the reactions we take a look at in the future. Uh, so how do we create these orbitals from scratch? So here I've kind of got the empty framework uh, to use here. So and again, your lowest energy one, always easy. Your wave functions will be matching or in phase all the way across. So I've put blue on top, green on bottom, and again, you could have done it vice versa, same diff. So then your highest energy one is always equally easy because they just always alternate going across. So there's psi 3 antibonding. So and here's where things are going to get a little bit funky. So and the funny thing here is that we need one node. And with one vertical node, it has to be right down the middle. Well, normally we'd have a p orbital right there, but a node is where you have zero electron density, where the electrons can never be, which means there's actually no electron density there. And we'll get rid of that p orbital there. So we'll just kind of erase this off of our diagram. So, but we want to remember that that's normally where an orbital is, not just two orbitals here, but that normally orbitals, we usually put a dot right there. So, but this has to be a node. And so in this case, anytime you cross that node, whether it be two adjacent orbitals or what, you know, now look adjacent but have a node in between them, you've got to switch wave functions there. So they're going to be out of phase. And so in this case, with an odd number of p orbitals involved, you often have nodes right where normally an orbital would be, especially when you have an odd number of nodes. Uh, so in this case, that's your molecular orbital picture there. A little bit of pain in the butt. One other thing to note, if you look, we said that your lower half of your molecular orbitals are bonding, the upper half are antibonding. But what if you have an odd number then? Well, in this case, psi 1 is bonding. Psi 3 is antibonding, but psi 2 is right in the middle. It's not in the upper half or the lower half. It's right in the middle. And so it turns out psi two is going to be non-bonding, like the equivalent of just a lone pair of electrons on an atom, non-bonding electrons. That's the equivalent there. So it's not bonding, it's not antibonding, it's non-bonding. So the second funky thing you see when you've got an odd number of p orbitals involved in your conjugated system. Okay, so now we'll compare the allyl cation with the allyl radical with the allyl anion. So, and the big difference here is the diagrams are actually exactly the same. We still have three p orbitals in a conjugated system in every single case. The difference will be the number of electrons. Your allyl cation has just got the pair of pi electrons there. So two electrons. That makes psi 1 the homo and psi 2 the lumo. Now the anion, I'm going to skip over the radical for a second. The anion, so it turns out if you draw an additional resonance structure here, so you could show this guy as well. And so we'd have resonance here. And so it turns out to get to that resonance structure, you dump these here and these here. And so the key here is realizing that the lone pair is now this pi bond over here and is therefore part of the pi system. So those are part of the pi system. So you actually have four electrons to fill in. So you put two here, two in psi two. And so psi two becomes the homo. That makes psi three the lumo. Same thing over here. So with the radical, once again, by resonance, you can see that that radical electron is actually part of the conjugated pi system. So, and as a result, you actually have three electrons to fill in here. And so psi two, the highest energy orbital that has any electrons is the homo. And then the lowest energy empty or unoccupied orbital, psi three, is the lumo. Now, one thing to note, I say that, but some people prefer the term 
SOMO for Psi 2 instead of HOMO. And SOMO stands for singularly occupied molecular orbital since there's just a single electron in there. So, but most people prefer to still use the same HOMO and LUMO convention like normal. Uh, but that's your big difference between the cation, radical, and anion for the allyl system.